Hello and welcome to Outrage and Optimism, a new podcast about solving the climate crisis and remaking the world. I'm Tom Rivet Karnak. I'm Christiana Figueres. And I'm Paul Dickinson. Today, we bring you a special conversation with Prime Minister Theresa May. In her final days of office, the Prime Minister has announced a net zero by 2050 target for the UK. This is the most ambitious target of any G7 country. We talk to her about why she's done it and what it means. So we have something special for you today. Theresa May, the outgoing Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, has invited us to come to number 10 to have a discussion with Christiana about the net zero target by 2050 that the UK has adopted. Now, we haven't had a G7 head of government on the podcast yet, so this is new for us. And I don't know if Theresa May has been on many podcasts, so perhaps it's new for her too. But I thought what we might do at the top end is just spend a few minutes talking about the target itself, what the missing pieces are, so that we can understand it better. So just to set the scene here, it is undeniable that this is ambitious by international standards. It's true that other countries like Costa Rica and Finland have set targets like this, but the UK is the first G7 country to do so and by far the largest economy. And it's also done this at a critical time. Uh, We need to see countries stepping up with significant additional ambition between now and the end of 2020 to give us a chance to stay at 1.5 degrees. And this signal from the UK could well precipitate more countries around the world stepping up. And we're already beginning to see that with encouraging signals from the Germans and the French about an EU step up. On the other hand, lots of commentators in the UK that I've been looking at have been saying, yes, well, okay, but... Aviation and shipping are not included in the UK target. And the UK has also introduced a measure to say that unless other countries follow suit, then they will not be bound by these commitments. And anyway, the UK is not on target to hit its ambition in 2023. So I think the place we should start before we go into this conversation with the Prime Minister is what do we think about this net zero goal? Well, if I if I can jump in here, there are many things to be said about this, but uh, I would like to start with the historical symbolism of this. It is the UK where uh, the Industrial Revolution was born. If there is a country that built itself up on coal, it is the UK. And uh, so the fact that uh, the UK has now managed to substantially, dramatically, I would say, bring down its dependence on coal, but not only that, to be the first G7 country, as you say, to commit itself on a legal basis, uh, legally binding basis to a goal of carbon neutrality by 2050, thereby, I would say, leading certainly industrialized countries into a new era of clean energy, I think is very, very... Uh, historically important. It's incredibly exciting. Um, you know, the, the UK actually has far far more really large companies than you might think. It's, uh, you know, the, the, the UK, the FTSE 100, they're huge global companies. Here, government's giving a real signal and lending its name. And I think it will encourage business to follow and lend their names. Uh, it, it's clear intent that we're going to be, you know, net zero by, by 2050 now. Uh, does we mean are we going to definitely going to deliver on that? Well, you know, the future is to some extent unpredictable, but it's like committing to giving up smoking or something. The commitment is an important mm. first step, and it changes the whole way you think about what you're doing from that point onwards. You know, the the big change for the UK is moving from eighty percent to a hundred percent of uh, right. cutting emissions, uh, because that's what the UK had before before June uh, June eleventh. So. Um, I think that is important, not just because it ups 20%, but rather because there is a psychological, very predictable psychological effect that if it's 80%, then you can predict that many people, corporations, cities, etc., will want to squeeze into the 20%. That is not mm. um, that. Mm. That is not yeah. uh, a reduction, uh, and so by going to a hundred percent, that sends a very very strong signal that there is actually no exception. That this is for every corporation, for every sector, for every citizen, for every city, uh, 
And and therefore, from the policy point of view, it sends a much stronger signal to detonate a huge number of innovation policies and innovative technologies that will, I think, help the UK, but other countries as well, reach the carbon neutrality target mark my words, before 2050, (laughs) because they're really stringent on the 100%. I think the 100% is more important to send a signal than the date. Yeah. And I think, you know, one interesting thing about her is obviously she's at the end of her premiership. And, um, you know, a few days from now, or or whenever it may be, when the leadership election is, is completed, she'll be stepping down. So, you know, she she didn't have to do this. Um, she didn't have to do either this or, or, or anything. But the, to the degree that um, she has spent what political capital she has left on deciding that she wanted to do something significant on climate. And yes, there were lots of people pushing her, but but still, that was her initiative. So I'd be really interested in, in your conversation, Christiana, in why did she choose to do that? What motivated her to do this now? Because it's not always been an issue that she's been associated with. No, no. And she's clearly stepping in here to legacy, right? She's clearly beginning to look at how is history going to look back on her. Yeah. So it definitely is a a, a legacy issue for her and a very positive one. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, arguably in the long term, this will have a much bigger impact than the Brexit issue, which has consumed so much of her premiership. I think so. I think history will judge her for having had the vision, albeit at the last minute, but still uh, to uh, to put this out and and we should say supported quite importantly by uh, just an extraordinary number of uh, of MPs, two hundred MPs of all parties, and the fact that uh, most contenders to the leadership position of the Conservative Party have actually uh, supported her on this. Boris Johnson himself, yeah, uh, she has gotten incredible support from business, from science, from faith or, uh, communities, and a very, very broad support from uh, from civil society. So quite impressive, I'm sure, for her, the experience of having put a very bold vision out that has united the country, quite a different experience to her Brexit experience that has actually so deeply divided the country. That's beautifully put. So just before we head off to go and have this conversation with the Prime Minister, I think the final thing which it would be interesting for us to discuss is the impact of this internationally. Because, of course, it will have a big impact on the UK and will really transform life in the UK if properly implemented in the coming decades. But but the game is bigger than that. And the game is, can we get sufficient numbers of countries around the world to really step up their ambitions? So um, what do you think that this will do to the international dynamics. Now that the UK has done this, what will it mean for other countries that then don't step up and follow the UK's leadership? Well, I think it's um, it, it's definitely planting a flag uh, in front of uh, countries that need to be doing this. Um, whether it's going to be enough to mobilize a critical mass of countries, and I would say there are uh, definitely OECD countries, with the exception of the United States, that we know will not uh, will not do this next year. Uh, but will the other OECD countries beyond the EU be able to step up remains to be seen. How many developing countries will step up? I, I would say probably most, if not all, of the exceedingly vulnerable countries will definitely step up because this is about their survival. Um, but what about, you know, the G20? What about the 20 highest emitting and highest and, and largest uh, economies of the world? I think that is really going to be the test, whether the majority of the G20 countries are able to step up uh, to, to this uh, sometime between now and next year. And furthermore, let's to just go into more detail, let's understand that setting a net zero goal for 2050 is crucial critically important and not sufficient because what it does is it sets a long-term target and what countries need to do and what the UK homework still is, is to say in service of that carbon neutrality by 2050, here's what we're going to do over the next 5, 10 to 15 years. So you have to be long-term sighted, but short-term implementing. 
Yeah, no, I mean, I just, it's amazing leadership. I hope and believe the EU will follow and many other countries. It's very, very exciting. Uh, the UK has now formally announced that it will host COP26, which is the conference of the parties where all countries get together once a year for further detail in the implementation of the Paris Agreement. So quite exciting that the UK, in preparation uh, for that, now um, has put out its carbon neutral target for 2050 and put itself in a very, from a political point of view, in a very uh, good position to be the president of uh, COP26. All right. Well, um, Christiana, you better get going. She's waiting for you. Well, I certainly do not want to keep Prime Minister Theresa May and 10 Downing Street waiting. I'm off. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so, so much for joining us, Prime Minister, and welcome to uh, Outrage and Optimism. Well, thank you very much, uh, Christiana. Very good to speak to you. And Prime Minister, uh, today we would actually like to celebrate that as your initiative and under your leadership, the UK has just announced a net zero greenhouse gas emissions goal for 2050. Uh, not an easy decision, but one that uh, I think really cements your legacy in, uh, in global climate change efforts. Why did you make the choice? It was a choice that you made. I, I know that you have said when you announced this that you feel that there is a moral duty to leave this world in a better condition than we inherited. Was that behind your, uh, your decision? Was it political? Was it leadership? Was it a long-term assessment of costs? What, what were the factors that you calibrated in order to make that decision? Well, first of all, I would say, I think for the UK, of course, we were the first country to legislate for long-term climate targets. And I think we can be proud of that and proud of our record. Um, but I do feel that it is important that we go further in order to safeguard the environment for the future. And I do have this sense, as you say, of the importance of us leaving uh, the planet in a better place than we find it. Mm. And that was an element behind the decision that I took. I've obviously received letters from other members of parliament, from scientists, all coalescing around the importance of this net zero emissions target by 2050. And I felt it was right to legislate, to, to, to put that target into legislation. There was, but there was a something, in a sense, a little more personal, if I may, which is that this is an issue on which we can talk about all the sort of science we can talk about, you know, people saying this is uh, the importance of this sort of net zero, zero target. Um, but, you know, I enjoy, my husband and I enjoy walking in the Swiss Alps on our holidays. And there's a particular place we go to. And over the last decade, more than a decade, probably, uh, in a particular spot, we have seen the glacier retreating at a pace that you would not normally mm -hmm. expect glaciers to move. Um, and that just says yes. to me that there's something we need to do about what's happening to our environment and what's happening to our planet. And so that was behind it as well. And I know it's an ambitious target, but I believe it's important that we set that ambitious target and protect our planet for future generations. Indeed, indeed. So I'm, I'm delighted to know that there was uh, your, the moral uh, imperative, but also your very personal experience. I'm always uh, uh, thrilled to hear how so many people come to this conclusion because of their personal experience and, and what they want to do for, uh, for future generations. But Prime Minister, I'm also quite impressed about the fact uh, that the UK is perhaps quite unique in the world in, in, in the sense that climate uh, change has not really divided uh, the, uh, the, the political views. Uh, your decision was publicly backed by nearly 200 MPs of all political parties. Uh, the uh, 10 out of the 11 contenders for the Conservative Party leadership and the front runner to succeed you, Boris Johnson, he has already said that he would keep this target that you have set. 
that um, and would actually work on uh, on how to get there. And I'm wondering whether there is a lesson here for other countries that have struggled to make this issue a unifying issue. Is there something um, that you could share about how the UK avoided climate change becoming such a partisan, uh, divisive issue? Well, I think it's partly about the sort of public debate we have about the encouragement for people um, of all ages and and young people particularly see this as a a real issue. Of course, it's their futures Mm -hmm. that this affects. Um, But I think the other key thing here in the UK is often when people look at this, when governments look at this issue of climate change, about reducing emissions... They, there's an argument that is made that you can either reduce emissions or you can have higher economic growth. Actually, you don't have to choose between those. And I think what we've shown here in the UK over the past uh, few years is precisely that. Since 2010, we've decarbonised our economy faster than any other G20 yes. nation. But we've also seen economic growth. Indeed. And I see this as, as an issue on which there are real opportunities already here in the UK. We have almost 400,000 people employed in the low carbon sector and its supply chains across our country. We've uh, got a modern industrial strategy uh, through which we're investing in clean growth uh, to ensure that we reap the rewards and and create 2 million high quality jobs there by 2030. So uh, I think it is important that we can see that we can have higher economic growth. There are those opportunities. Um, uh, developing technology gives us opportunities. We're, you know, we've already seen uh, last year a fifth of the electric vehicles sold in Europe were made in the UK. So we're, we're taking these steps already and showing that you can commit to uh, these targets on climate change. You can recognise the importance of dealing with climate change and at the same time ensure you're creating jobs for uh, people, high quality jobs for people, and we see economic growth, which is to everybody's benefit. Indeed. Indeed, it's quite a change of paradigm from where we were uh, a few years ago, but it's a critical change of paradigm and of understanding how decarbonizing the economy can be such a, a good motor for, uh, for job creation for for better city livability to to mention air pollution uh, where the UK has done so much to clean up uh, its air and uh, the UK is the first G7 country to set this ambitious goal we have other countries such as Norway and Finland and Chile and my own little tiny little Costa Rica that has set uh, ambitious goals. But the UK is the first G7 country, which is quite remarkable. Was that also part of your choice to certainly do the right thing by UK citizens and by UK future generations, but also to have implications for for the EU and for other OECD countries? Well, of course, if we're going to deal with climate change, actually, it has to be something that's addressed as a global issue and other countries do need to increase their ambition as well. Um, And certainly, um, I would like to think that the UK taking this step, I would hope that the UK taking this step would encourage other countries to take the step too. Uh, and to recognise the importance of the, this issue and of embracing this this target. And we certainly expect and we fully expect our international partners to follow our lead. I, I think, as you say, we're already seeing encouraging signs of this, including from France and uh, and from Germany. But it's important that we do see this, this um, response around the world. Uh, and um, But again, I would say, I think, you know, the UK... Uh, led the world in innovation during the Industrial Revolution. And, and now we must lead the world to a cleaner, greener form of growth. Indeed, indeed. And and who who better than the UK where the, uh, where the Industrial Revolution uh, was born? So who better than the UK to take us into the next energy revolution? And Prime Minister, um, the, the UK is currently a top contender uh, to host the Conference of the Parties of Climate Change next year in 2020. Now, should it be decided that uh, the UK will host COP, is it important to be able to position the UK to lead on a global issue such as climate change, especially in 2020, which will be in a post-Brexit world? Well, you're absolutely right. I mean, we've announced today that we're bidding, in partner, actually in partnership with Italy, to host 
COP26 in 2020. But I think this will be an opportunity to demonstrate continuing European leadership on climate change and, and to work together on this issue of shared concern. Um, what I would say is every year is critical in this, in this work we're doing in relation to climate change. So we need to continue to raise our sights in order to deliver on, on the promise of the 2015 Paris Agreement, which, of course, Christiana, you were so uh, instrumental in, uh, in delivering. And uh, if we're going to do what I talked about earlier, protecting the planet for our children for future generations, this is so important. And under the bid that we're putting together, this joint bid, the UK would host the COP summit and coordinate the overall agenda, and Italy would host preparatory events, including the pre-COP programme. I think we as the UK have a reputation for effective diplomacy, a record for hosting successful international events, um, including last year's Commonwealth Heads of Government Summit, which also drove progress on a number of environmental issues. And we're committed to ensuring that COP26 is a success. And I think uh, in that we can show not only our own commitment in relation to climate change issues, but hopefully bringing others together and uh, raising everybody's sights on how we can deliver on the agenda that's been set. Indeed. Um, and Prime Minister, I just wanted to ask you one more question. Um, and there I wanted to invite you to jump into the future with your imagination. Uh, it's currently 2019. But uh, what will British citizens in the year 2030, 2040, uh, what will the adults uh, uh, in that time period, how would you like them to look uh, back at the year 2019 at British leadership on this, or in fact, on the, on the, on the world's challenge uh, that we have now to move forward? How, how would you like them to remember this very um, important moment in history for the UK? Well, first of all, I, I hope that they would be proud of this important moment and uh, be able to look back on it and say that it was the UK that was the first major economy to take this step and showed others the importance of it and that others had, had followed. I hope in a day-to-day -day sense, people will be able to see that there are, as, as I mentioned earlier, you know, high quality jobs that have been created through the uh, work we've been doing in investing in clean growth. Um, we're ending the sale of conventional new diesel and petrol cars and vans by 2040 with our road to zero strategy. So they would see that as well in terms of a, um, a something practically that had uh, been delivered. Um, I, just as a wider sense, we're also, we've uh, set out a 25-year environmental plan to promote protect biodiversity, to promote sustainability, I think they would see those things coming through too. And uh, obviously in people's day-to-day -day lives, they will see a difference. I mean, if, you know, some of the things that we do today, such as um, some of the energy we use, we're going to have to uh, see a difference in that in the future. But what I hope most of all is people would look back and say, that was a step that the UK government took. It was the right thing to do. We're proud of it because we're going to see a better world in the future. Fantastic. Brilliant. Prime Minister, thank you so, so much for your leadership on this issue. Thank you for your vision and thank you for setting a bold target that is, I think, going to mobilize uh, UK citizens as well as European and abroad. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Christiana. Good to talk to you. So that was a fascinating experience to to listen to that conversation. Christiana, what do you leave that with? Well, I, I was grateful that um, Prime Minister Theresa May was uh, willing to share with us uh, some of the reasons uh, behind her decision. Uh, certainly morality played a, a big role for her, her understanding of long-term costs and opportunities to the UK um, economy, but also quite unusual for her that uh, she shared the personal story of of, uh, of watching the glacier, as we say, or glacier, as she said, um, uh, in retreat. And so she has a very personal connection uh, to climate change, which also uh, played a part in her decision. It's so inspiring to hear a head of state making a decision that's going to have massively positive ramifications for future generations. I just am so inspired by her leadership. Yeah, I think that um, 
you know, it's 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 been such a long time that we've been sort of struggling to get real global leaders kind of engaged in this issue in a personal way. And to sort of hear the degree to which she clearly thinks about this, she views it as a core part of sort of morality. I mean, you know, you can always sort of say it should have gone further. It wasn't enough in this particular way. But, you know, she did a thing. She did a pretty remarkable thing. And uh, to me, it would be it would be um, churlish to to not give her credit for that. And And we don't know how far this goes. I mean, now we see that countries will begin to step up and follow that leadership. It sent a signal, that all-important signal, to say, actually, you know, the UK is going in this direction and now sort of the game is on and we'll see through the Secretary General Summit and the COP in the UK, most probably towards the end of next year, what happens. But we've got everything to play for. I think we should feel very optimistic that this is the beginning of something really great. So thanks for listening to this special episode of Outrage and Optimism. We are delighted that so many of you are listening to the podcast and seem to be enjoying it, but please do remember to leave us a rating. It makes a huge difference. Just go to Apple Podcasts and rate us using the starred system. It takes one second and makes a huge amount of difference as we try to keep building the momentum with this new thing. So it just remains for me to say... Outrage and Optimism is produced by Clay Carnell. The team includes Pete Clutton-Brock, Chloe Revel, Natasha Rivet-Karnak, Alexandra Vargas-Morera, Sarah Thomas, Marina Mancilla, Callum Greve, and Zoe Cholakantic. I'd also like to thank Michael Northrup from Rockefeller Brothers Fund and Nigel Topping from We Mean Business. You can connect with us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and join us next week for another conversation. We'll see you then. We'll see you then.